During the time period that uh, Israel was split into two nations, there lived a prophet by the name of Jonah. Okay. Now you've heard of Jonah before. It's a rather famous Bible story of Jonah and the whale, right? But now let's discover some more details about that maybe you haven't heard before. Let's set the stage a little bit here. So, in ancient history, we've studied civilizations like the Egyptians and the uh, people who lived in Mesopotamia, especially the two uh, empires that kept coming into and fading from power, the Babylonians and the Assyrians. Now, both the Assyrians and the Babylonians play a very important role at this point in history in what is going on in Israel because they're the two main powers that border Israel. Okay? If you have the Mediterranean Sea here, okay, and Israel, which borders the Mediterranean, it is the Babylonian and Mesopotamian empires that go back and forth in having the uh, upper hand and power in the Mediterranean area. What does Mediterranean mean, by the way? Remember what Mediterranean means? I'm sorry, not Mediterranean. Mesopotamian. They don't remember what Mesopotamian means? Or Mesopotamia? Yes? Um, between Good. Between the rivers. You got it. Okay, between the rivers. I don't remember what two rivers were in the Mesopotamian area. Yes, uh, Rita. The Euphrates. The Euphrates and the, yes? Tigris, Tigris rivers. The Euphrates and the Tigris rivers. And the Mesopotamia area proper would have been between the rivers. Okay, between the rivers. There's a large plateau between the rivers that ran between them. But these civilizations grew up with their capital cities for Babylonia in the south and for Assyria. Their capital city was, and this is important for the purposes of our story, Nineveh in the north. Yes, you may. At some points, the uh, Babylonians would gain more power and they would take over the area. And at some point, they even took over part of Egypt, and so did the Assyrians. And at other times, they would be split. You'd have two empires, and um, at some times, the Assyrians would also gain more power. The Assyrians are in strength at the time of Jonah. The city of Nineveh is maybe one of the largest and most powerful wealthiest cities in the world, but is also one of the most sinful cities in the world, okay? Very sinful city. Now, when we studied the Babylonians and the Mesopotamians, we talked about how each one of these cultures had uh, a couple of o overriding uh, features about them that, that distinguished them from each other. For the Babylonians, it was their interest in arts and literature. Uh, not that they weren't out for conquest and money and gold and commerce, but they had a much larger interest in commerce, and I'm sorry, arts and literature, whereas the Assyrians were more interested in commerce and trade, but they were also, also very what? Does anyone remember what we said about the Assyrians? They had a trait that made them not so well liked. Rita? They were bloodthirsty, very bloodthirsty people. In fact, they were even known for their major child sacrifices, okay? There is no greater thing that devils love than to get people to sacrifice their children. What greater sin can there be than people sacrificing and killing babies, okay? Which tells you why abortion is such an evil today, okay? Because of the killing of unborn children, okay? If that's not demonic, I don't know what is. And these people worship these false gods, these false gods, these pagan gods, they were demons, a lot of them. And so 
These demons wanted people to sacrifice their children. What a terrible, terrible sin. And the Assyrians were bloodthirsty people. They were known for this. So, Jonah's a great prophet, and God says to Jonah, okay, Jonah, I want you to go to Nineveh and warn them that I am going to destroy their city unless they repent. Uh, that's, what he says. I'm just gonna, that's what he says. I want you to go to them and tell them I'm going to destroy their city. And Noah's re- uh, I'm sorry, Jonah's reaction was kind of like this. Jonah went, well, um, but if I do that, I don't think they're going to like the news that their city is going to be destroyed because they're sinful. And knowing the Assyrians, they're probably going to kill me. God said, Jonah, I need you to go to Nineveh and tell them that I'm going to destroy their city because of their sinfulness. So what does Jonah do? Does he go right to the city and proclaim that, Siobhan? He went and hid in the ship. He went and hid, right? He went out in a ship. Maybe it was on the Mediterranean, right? On a boat that's sailing this direction. So here's Nineveh over here. And that boat's going the other way. Okay. Jonah's like, there is no way that I am going to tell the Assyrians that God's going to destroy their city because they're so sinful. Okay. And he's out on this ship. And he's hoping to get to a distant country as far away from Assyria as he possibly can when the ship hits a storm. The storm gets worse and worse and worse. And the sailors on the ship... And the captain of the ship, they just can't believe this storm. They've never seen anything like it. That captain had been the captain of his ship for years, probably decades even. He had never seen a storm like this. And they started to cry out because they, they knew that they were going to all die. The ship was never going to be able to withstand the storm. It was going to capsize. It was going to sink. So finally, Jonah comes to the captain, to the sailors, and says, this storm is my fault. He said, I was sent on an errand from God and I ran away. But I realize now you can't run away from God. There's only one way to save your ship. He said, this storm was sent for me. Throw me overboard. Throw me overboard. It's the only way to save your ship. But of course, the sailors and the captain said, no, no, it's okay. No, nah. they grabbed Jonah and they threw him overboard. He said, holy smokes, get off our ship. And as soon as they did that, boom, Jonah goes in the water and swallowed by a large, the the Bible says a great fish, a great fish swallows Jonah. And the storm dissipates, it goes away, and the sailors continue on their travels to the distant land. Now, has anyone ever seen uh, any nature shows or read in any books about what the inside of maybe the belly of, they sometimes find the bellies of sharks? What do they find sometimes in the bellies of sharks, uh, Jerome? Um, specifically. Food that they eat, like what? Um, fish. fish, what else? Uh, Luke? Uh, people. No, they found people's arms and stuff before, that's for sure. What else? Siobhan? Coats. Coats, what else? They find garbage sometimes, right? like tires, and they found license plates in the bellies of sharks. Uh, We don't know what kind of fish it was, whether it was a a whale or some other fish, but we do know that Jonah was preserved in the belly of the fish, okay, whole and alive, for three days. God punished him by keeping him in there for three days and keeping him alive. You can imagine how pretty horrible that was, to be stuck in the belly of a fish for three days. And after three days, the fish throws Jonah out of its belly. It spits him out upon the shore. And Jonah repents. Well, I'm sure Jonah had repented while he was in the belly of the fish and begins his travels towards Nineveh. Now, before we move on, though, what does Jonah foreshadow? Foreshadow means something that comes before, okay, and prefigures or... Uh, gives you an example of what is going to occur in the future. It's a foreshadow of something. So what did Jonah foreshadow, Joey? What do you think? 
spending three days in the belly of a whale before coming out. What does that prefigure, foreshadow? Is there something about the life of our Lord? Three days? Okay, well, no, it doesn't prefigure that. Luke? Holy week or? Well, not Holy Week. You're getting closer at least. Patrick? Good Friday? Okay, Good Friday until when? Right, until so the three days our Lord spent in the belly of the earth. Didn't our Lord spend three days in the tomb before he was resurrected? That's why God had Jonah stay, and it was a, it was a foreshadowing for us of our Lord spending three days in the belly of the earth before his resurrection. It was the same thing with Jonah. He spent three days in the belly of the fish before he was resurrected, so to speak, to go and do his mission, okay, which was to go to Nineveh. So Jonah does go to Nineveh. Okay. And he gets there and, and he preaches. He gives the message to the people. Okay. God is going to destroy their city. Now, here's the amazing thing Did the Assyrians grab Jonah and skin him alive and throw him in boiling oil and feather and tar him and pull out his toenails? They didn't do any of that. Actually, the people of Nineveh, and especially the king of Nineveh, took Jonah very seriously. Maybe their consciences, 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 conscience, consciences, huh, were bothering them. Maybe they knew what they were doing was wrong. But whatever it was, Jonah showing up was what they needed. And the king told his people, we are going to do penance. We are going to repent of our evil ways and we are going to do penance. And he ordered everybody in the kingdom to put on sackcloths. You don't know what a sackcloth is? I've really heard the term before. Siobhan? Um, it's a cloth. Like, uh, it's made out of sacks. Like, it's very uncomfortable. Okay. Yeah, it's very uncomfortable. It's probably, in those days, may, may have been made out of, say, like horse hair or animal hair. And you know how, you know, you ever get a haircut? And your hair gets on you, especially the boys. If it's if it's smaller, right? It, hair can be really itchy. Okay, horse's hair is very, uh, especially if it was horse's hair, it could be ox hair, any kind, is very rough and coarse, and it sticks out. And it's made, you know, like to carry bags of potatoes or something in, not to wear. Okay, so they all put on sackcloths. They put on these very uncomfortable shirts and clothing that was very itchy and uncomfortable to wear. And then they all took ashes and put ashes on their heads, okay, to signify, just like we do on Ash Wednesday, that we are dust and to dust we will return and to show as a matter of penance that we acknowledge that we are nothing before God. And that's what they were doing. So the entire city puts on sackcloths and ashes on their head. And they do penance. The king and all his subjects begged God for forgiveness. And God was pleased with the conversion of the city and forgave them. didn't destroy the city. Instead, the city converted and was forgiven. All right, so now back over in the kingdom of Israel. So back over in the kingdom of Israel. Now, the kingdom of Israel and Judah were to go through many kings during the time of their division. So we're going to highlight a few especially notable, either because of their wickedness or holiness. <laughs> and in this case, we are going to highlight a very, well, he became very wicked. A king by the name of
Ahab. Okay? Ahab not only had people worship the two golden calves, but he married a very wicked woman by the name of Jezebel. Okay? Here's the king, and he marries the queen. Now, Ahab had an aversion to being wicked. And probably may, may have been able to overcome that if he had found the right person in life to be with. And this is an example of why it's so important to choose your friends and your spouse so carefully. Because Jezebel was a very wicked woman. Not only was she a very wicked woman, but she was very much an idolater. Okay? And the, one of the first things she does is she builds an altar for her false god, Melkart. M-E-L-K-A-R-T. Okay. She builds an altar to her false So, now the people not only have their two golden calves, they also have, what probably amounts to, a demon for a pagan god to worship, given to them by their queen. Okay. So here God now raises up someone to help fight this wickedness. He sends to the land the prophet Elias, one of the greatest prophets. Prophet Elias. And Elias goes to Achab and Jezebel, who are very evil. So evil, in fact, that all of the true the rest of the true priests in the land had run off and lived in caves to hide from them. And she had put in their places all of her false priests and pagan priests. But Elias was not afraid. He knew that with God anything was possible. And he went to King Ahab. And he said, Because of your sinfulness, Because of your sinfulness, your land is going to be punished. And you must repent. Okay? Just like Jonah, Elias brought a message of repentance to the king. Okay? So this is one of the reasons we're looking at these two stories back to back. Because we're going to see the very different way that the people and the king react to the prophet sent by God. And the different way that God then treats the people based upon their reaction to his warning. Okay? He says, if you don't repent, that no rain will fall in your country for the next three years. Now, if it were not to rain here in the United States for three years, the effects would be devastating. And we're a much more modern country with water reserves and lakes. These were people who very much depended upon being able to survive by um, the rainfall. They didn't have, uh, you know, indoor plumbing and water pipes run and irrigation run all through the country, their country. If three years of no rain would devastate us today, imagine what it would do to a country then. There would be nothing that could, not only would you not have water, but you, would have not, you wouldn't be able to grow anything. You wouldn't be able to grow anything. So this was a very, very serious matter. And Acab at first was thinking about it, but Jezebel said, no way, you get out of here. No way. And Ahab said, you're right. You're right, Jezebel. Get out of here, Elias. Leave us. In fact, maybe he would have even had him killed. But Elias went off and lived near the River Jordan during this time of no rain. So, uh, let's go this direction. So he lives near... The Jordan River. 
And uh, the Jordan River is where the Israelites first crossed over to get in the Promised Land. And uh, um, Joshua had them carry the ark, and then when they did, the, the water stopped so they could cross, and they put the 12 rocks in the Jordan River. The Jordan River is where much of these Bible stories um, regarding the life of our Lord take place. In fact, it was where uh, John the Baptist baptized our Lord in the Jordan River. Okay, So he goes and he lives near the Jordan River. And he lives there during this time. There's water for him there to drink. And God supplies him with food through the use of uh, ravens. Ravens would fly to him food. From, they would go and they would collect it and they'd bring it back to him. He lived very sparsely. He did penance himself as well for the sins of man and, and himself. Okay, and He lived a holy life there during this three-year period. Okay. One day while he was there, and we're going to split off from this story. We're going to come back to it. So this is the beginning. Now we're going to go into a middle area. And they'll call this middle area. This middle area will be while he's living near the Jordan River. Okay. So we're going to go into a little different story about Elias. There were good people in Israel, in the kingdom of Israel. And one of them was a widow. And while Elias was um, walking along basically through the desert. Most of Israel was a desert at that point. He came upon the house of a widow and he asked her for some food. He didn't have any and he just asked if she had a little food to be able to spare him. And the widow was a holy woman and she told Elias that all she had left was a little grain and oil. So Elias begged some food All she has left is a little grain and oil. Now, grain is could be it could have been wheat or barley or whatever, but you can make bread from it, okay, which could be a fairly hearty meal if you can make bread. That's what grain is good for. Grain also you can make beer with grain, right? You can make pancakes, grain, you can make a lot of different things. Oil is good because it provides uh, something to cook things in. It provides good essential fatty acids for your body. Okay. The problem is she only had a little left. In fact, she only had enough left for her. She had a son and for Elias. And she, but she invited him in. She said, this is all that we have left, but you come in and you share with us. Okay. And after that, I'm going to be out of food. But please come in and share. And so Elias does. He comes in and she makes a meal. So she invites him in and uses up the rest of her food. The rest of her grain and oil. That's it. She's out. None left. No more to be found anywhere. It has not rained for so long. They're unable to grow anything. Oil can come from uh, plant sources, animals and that, but there's, there's no plants, animals, uh, olives. Um, no way to get any kind of oil. They're out. They're done. But something miraculous happened. After they finished eating, she went back to the pantry and found that both her grain and oil were full. In fact, they were both fuller than when before she made the meal. And over the course of the rest of the drought, neither one of those things ever ran out again for her. She was willing to give the last of what she had in charity for another person, and God rewarded her by taking care of her and her son for the remainder of the drought. So Elias would come to visit them. They would pray together, and he, pro he probably would actually offer sacrifice for, with, with them because he was a, a priest. Okay, say prayers, and then he'd go live out by the, the river again. So one time he comes back to visit her, and he finds, unfortunately, that her son... So if we put this as the widow's story number one, this could be the widow's story number two. Her son died in the absence of Elias. He had just passed away the day before.
Elias comes. He prays over the sun. And he came back to life. The widow's faithfulness and holiness for willing to give everything that her and her son had for someone else were repaid ten times over. Not only were her and her son taken care of with their food for the rest of the drought, but even when her son dies, Elias returns. He prays over the body of the son, and her son comes back to life. So this is all going on during the period of the drought, but the drought is about to end. And tomorrow we're going to pick up and talk about how different King Ahab and Jezebel's reactions were to the king of Nineveh and to the widow and the difference in how God treats them versus those that, that repent and or just remain holy 